Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Sorry for the delay. We we're having a, a little issue we we're trying to work through. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us today. This is a, a comprehensive guide to the ANSI ISEA Z358.1 and emergency shower eyewash compliance. Um, we greatly appreciate you joining us. We're going to cover the entire standard today, uh, go over it in depth, a little bit how to test some best practices uh, and some other uh, great stuff that we think you'll we'll, we'll find really uh, useful. So to start, uh, questions uh, will be taken at any time during the webinar. Please post them uh, whenever you have them. Uh, we don't want you to forget. I'll, I'll be sure to answer all of those questions in a follow-up uh, email that goes out if I can't answer them in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so make sure you use the control panel to uh, submit those questions when you get them, and uh, we'll make sure to follow up with those uh, and get you answers uh, after the webinar. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. It'll be available on demand and sent to you in a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours after the presentation. Poll questions will be launched throughout the presentation. Uh, and your participation is greatly appreciated. It uh, allows us to continue to improve this and uh, make it uh, a useful resource for you. Uh, a follow-up survey will be sent after the webinar uh, and we'll bribe you with a $5 Starbucks gift card uh, for your participation on that as well. So uh, thank you ahead of time. There's my face. Uh, my name is Justin Dunn. I am the sales product specialist and trainer for Haas. Uh, with me is uh, Nicole Dennison. She's running the uh, webinar here in the back, fixing the issues that uh, were likely my fault. Um, she is our marketing manager here at Haas. Today's topics include the uh, what is the ANSI ISEA Z358.1-2014 standard, uh, the most current version of it, the significant requirements of that standard. I'll walk you through a little bit on how to test uh, for those requirements, best practices for emergency equipment, and then we'll close out with that q and I'll get to your questions, answer them the best that I can, and follow up with any that I don't end up getting to. So to start, uh, if you're not already familiar with OSHA, uh, it's a very important step to understanding uh, why we comply with ANSI, um, and uh, OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, they are the agency responsible for regulating emergency shower and eye wash facilities. Uh, their standard is currently uh, 29 CFR 1910.151C under medical services and first aid. And all it states is that where the eyes or body of any person may be exposed to injurious corrosive materials, that suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and body need to be provided within the work area for immediate emergency use. Now, all that really tells us is that if we have uh, situations where we have the potential for workers to be exposed to corrosive uh, or dangerous materials, we have to have emergency equipment. But what it doesn't tell us is that the kind of equipment that we need, how it needs to perform, where it needs to go, and things like that. So moving on, uh, the primary uh, reason for our, uh, the, the webinar today and uh, covering the ANSI standard is that we are here to help prevent injuries and fatalities, uh, lower general workplace risk, uh, lost time and money, of course, uh, both for the employee and for the employer. Uh, it is expensive to be non-compliant and caught on the other end of what could be a lawsuit and um, and uh, and many other things. So uh, OSHA has uh, stepped up enforcement, uh, particularly for employers who have a, a history of serious or repeated violations. Um, those are the most dangerous situations. You know, we've told you to fix something, you've decided to uh, ignore those warnings, and you are continuing. Um, on August 1st, 2016, OSHA fines increased for the first time since 1990 by 80%, which was a, a gigantic percentage. Uh, made for a really scary number. Um, to uh, to continue with this, effective January 2nd, 2018, OSHA fines have increased by an additional 2% to account for inflation. So year over year, they're readjusting now those fines to adjust for inflation and um, and 
to uh, continue to raise those fines to encourage compliance. Now, this is just a really uh, easy to, to look at uh, map. All this is public information. I'm not outing any companies here. Uh, this is just an OSHA fines infographic. I wanted to give everybody a couple examples of uh, penalties, violations. Uh, for example, let's pick uh, the elephant on the page. Uh, Cinnamonson uh, in New Jersey, Transaxle LLC. Uh, failure to provide adequate eyewashes for employees exposed to hazardous substances, which is, I mean, a wide variety of things. But the total penalty, $382,000, uh, which is, a, a, again, that big scary number um, that we want to prevent. Um, and part of that's following the ANSI standard and making sure that we're providing compliant equipment. A big issue with emergency equipment is that, uh, well, you, you have to have it, but you you get it, it gets installed, it goes into a dark, dingy corner in your facility, people forget about it, eventually they stop testing it, and then unfortunately when people eventually need it, they turn it on and nothing happens. And that's um, a terrible, dangerous situation to be in, and one of the main reasons that we uh, like to hold webinars on this, educate everybody and try to prevent situations like that. Uh, moving on. Uh, what is the ANSI standard? So it was written by the uh, the ISEA, the International Safety Equipment Association, uh, and it defines emergency eyewash, shower design, location, and the temperature requirements for proper functionality and usage, which is why OSHA references it. Their 29 CFR 1910.151C does uh, only has that one paragraph. It doesn't give us instructions on how to comply with it. So OSHA references the ANSI standard as the primary source for compliance with their own standard. So uh, during site inspections, violation reporting, uh, ANSI is always the uh, recognized and referred to document. It was first published in 1981 and had several revisions afterwards, uh, first in 1990, 1998, 2004, 2009, and eventually 2014, which is our most current revision of the standard. Uh, the standard itself will likely go through a, a re-release uh, within the next year or two, um, and we'll eventually get a, a new version of this uh, um, coming out of the pipeline. But uh, our best understanding of this version, 2014, is how we're going to stay compliant for now. So 2009, uh, some of the most important revisions included uh, the temperature range for water delivery, uh, simultaneous use of the eyewash and the shower, eyewash testing requirements, which was a, a big change at the time. Uh, the 2014 revision included design, manufacture, and installation of emergency showers. After that, the equipment installation location, which wasn't really touched on before, but was incredibly important to help people understand that it needs to be as close as possible, um, but within a certain distance. And then some other adjusted measurements that were more meant for manufacturers of emergency equipment uh, to ensure that uh, the process of making these is in keeping with uh, what's necessary to keep these compliant in your facilities. Okay, we're going to get into poll question number one. Uh, Nicole, if you would launch that, please. Okay. All right. First question, which best describes your role in choosing showers and eye face washes? Uh, please select one below. And while you're filling out these uh, polls, I just want to call out that we are having a little issue with our chat. Um, so just if you are putting in questions, we will definitely get to those at the end. Uh, you're not being ignored. Um, so keep, keep pushing them through. And if you have any issues at all, um, just like I said, throw it in the questions and we'll, we'll definitely try to address it. And we thank you for your patience. And we'll go ahead and close this. Okay, thanks again, uh, everybody, for participating in that. I promise I'm not ignoring you. We'll get to those questions. Uh, I'll get to as many as I possibly can for the Q&A. Um, we just try to pack this uh, uh, with so much information. Sometimes we run uh, a little tight there at the end, but I'll hang around, uh, answer some questions, and get as many of those uh, um, 
answered as possible. So we're gonna move on to the significant requirements of the standard and how to test for those requirements right now. Um, this is the uh, the meat of the presentation. So if you're gonna have questions, it's probably gonna be in this portion. Uh, don't be uh, afraid to submit those questions and uh, I promise I'll follow up. So weekly testing and uh, versus an annual inspection, both are required for emergency equipment, plumbed and unplumbed equipment. Uh, the ANSI minimum uh, performance requirements on a weekly basis are that the emergency equipment needs to be activated, for one. Uh, the activation of the equipment needs to ensure that there is water to the heads of the device or devices, and that the duration of the activation shall be sufficient uh, to ensure that all stagnant water in the dead leg is flush from the unit itself, and that all sections of piping that don't form a, a circulation system uh, have to be cleaned out. So just the, the point from the source of the water to the equipment, we gotta get all that out of there, flush out any anything uh, to keep any growth out of the line and things like that. For unplumbed emergency equipment, this just means a visual inspection, right? We have self-contained equipment, uh, portable equipment, uh, air charged equipment where it's got a its own source of water contained inside of the equipment. All we're doing is, A, if it's a, a gravity fed type of equipment is opening the tank, looking inside, making sure that it has enough water to meet our 15 minute requirements and that there's nothing, you know, disgusting in the tank. And then on our air charged equipment, so long as it is, because we can't just pop that open and, uh, uh, check out how much water is inside on a weekly basis without, uh, you know, uh, releasing the air and recharging it afterwards. So, so long as you're visiting the equipment, the unit is charged according to the air pressure gauge in accordance with the manufacturer's suggestions or recommendations, uh, requirements, then it's compliant. So, visit the equipment, make sure there's enough water or it's charged correctly, and you're good to go on the uh, portable type equipment. On the annual inspection, everything uh, from A to Z is required. Uh, you have to visit the equipment, you have to activate it, you have to measure the height of the pool rod, the height of the shower head. Uh, everything has to be done to ensure its compliance. It also has to run for a full 15 minutes, which is difficult to do. And I understand that uh, more and more equipment um, is becoming available to make this as easy as possible. If you can plumb the water that you're running to a nearby drain or something like that, it can it help a, a lot. Unfortunately, there is no requirements in the ANSI standard for drainage. Uh, that's all based on local plumbing code. So um, the 15 minutes can be difficult to uh, accomplish, especially in sensitive settings like hospitals and schools and things like that. But we gotta do our best to ensure that they can operate for a full 15 minutes, which is the minimum amount of time you have to be in this equipment, uh, pretty much across the board. Once we get into more extreme chemicals like acids and corrosives, uh, sometimes half an hour, 45 minutes, um, this is all based on the SDS sheet. So make sure you're checking your SDS for those chemicals and then we'll know how long those need to run. But ensure you're testing for 15 minutes. Some of the tools that you're gonna need, you're gonna need a tape measure. There's a lot of the measurements of the uh, uh, the height of the flow, the pool rod, the shower, things like that that you'll need to measure. You'll need an eyewash gauge. Our model is a 9015. Uh, uh, it's that little gauge just below the bucket, and I'll go over how that's used. You'll need a five gallon bucket with the two gallon water line marked. Um, super simple, it's like checking your pulse, um, and because uh, we're not gonna test it for a full 15 minutes or uh, 60 seconds, so uh, we wanna use the, uh, five gallon bucket. The shower sock and pole, uh, we need a thermometer because it's gotta be ANSI compliant for temperature and then an ANSI checklist uh, to ensure that we're covering all of the requirements. Okay, so to start, uh, one of the first things that we need to focus on is that the equipment needs to be accessible within 10 seconds or within 55 feet. Uh, to test this, you need to check for the proximity to the hazard. Whatever the source is of the um, uh, corrosive danger or, uh, you know, source of the hazard in the area. We have to measure from that point to the emergency equipment. If the emergency equipment can be located centrally inside of the room uh, to ensure compliance, that's best. 
Um, if you can get a laser uh, tape measure device to measure the distance from the equipment, uh, that's a great way to go. But we have to make sure with it, it's within 55 feet. Um, 55 feet, if you're actually looking at the ANSI standard, is in the addendum to the standard. Uh, throughout the standard, it says 10 seconds, but that's different for all of us. We can't all move the same distance in 10 seconds. Uh, so 55 feet was added as a measurable distance. Uh, next, it needs to be located on the same level as the hazard. We can't have any change in level, right? If we've got chemicals, we've got dirt, we've got something hazardous in our eyes. Uh, it's difficult to navigate the terrain between where we're at to the emergency equipment. And we don't need to make an obstacle course. We want it to be as easy as possible to get from point A to point B. And that means that we can't include stairs. Uh, change in levels um, and things like that. So try to avoid steps and anything like that in between the, the hazard and the equipment. Uh, it needs to be free of obstructions. So there's examples over there on the right. These are real situations. You'd be surprised how often, again, the emergency equipment gets installed. It's forgotten. People pile junk around it. Uh, we have to make sure that when somebody's having an emergency, they're not clearing their path towards the emergency equipment. This can be tool carts, garbage cans, cleaning equipment, all types of stuff. Um, even uh, hoses running across the ground, those are tripping hazards. And sometimes seconds really count uh, for the victim, whether they keep their eyesight or not, whether they, um, you know, how many days they're gonna spend in the hospital. Uh, many of those days can be saved based on how quick they get to this emergency equipment. So make sure there's no obstructions. The area needs to be well lit. It needs to be easily identifiable with high, highly visible signage. Okay, when we have this emergency, we need to quickly be able to identify the emergency equipment in the area um, and move to it as fast as possible. And part of that's making sure that the area is well lit um, and we can identify that emergency equi uh, equipment as quickly as possible. You know, it's not always top of mind um, when you're doing these tasks and there's always ha human error that we have to consider. So make it as easy as possible. Um, there's lots of ways to improve this. There's three-sided signage, you know, and things like that that we can add to this equipment to make it as, as high vis as possible. So check for proper signage and uh, check the area for adequate lighting. Uh, the equipment also needs to deliver the flushing fluid for a full 15 minutes. So run each piece of equipment for a full 15 minutes. Uh, remember that's only on an annual basis that you really have to do that. Uh, otherwise, when you're doing weekly chess, it's just a spot check. You're just quickly turning it on, off. I've got water. I cleared out the dead leg. I'm good to go. The outlets for the equipment need to be protected from airborne contaminants, right? We don't want getting anything getting into the tanks, building up in the heads of the device, uh, making it difficult to use or launching contaminants into a victim's eyes when they decide to use the equipment. So ensure that all heads of the device and the stored flushing fluid is completely covered. Dust caps, dust covers are in place. These are very frequently um, not replaced by employees when they're doing the testing. So make sure that they understand that this is an important requirement in the ANSI standard and the dust covers have to be in place to protect the equipment. Uh, one thing that's not frequently uh, spoken about, but the, the dust covers have to be self-removing too. Um, when I say it out loud, it seems like a kind of a no duh part of the standard, but once you activate that equipment, we can't have a, a separate motion to remove the dust cover. Uh, once the water flow starts, it has to remove the dust cover itself, all in one motion. Um, otherwise, you're taking more time to remove the dust cover and uh, prolonging the amount of time it takes for you to get first aid. So activate the unit, just ensure that the dust cover comes off without any assistance from uh, yourself. Now the equipment needs to go from off to on in one second or less, and it needs to remain on without the use of the operator's hands. Both of these are incredibly important. It has to activate immediately, and we don't want somebody having to use their hands to keep the equipment on. A very popular piece of uh, hardware on these back in the day was uh, self-closing valves. If you have self-closing valves on your equipment, those need to be replaced immediately, okay? Um, the concept of having to hold the shower open, hold the eyewash open, 
and hold your eyes open and remove your clothing and all these things that you're going to have to do to deal with this emergency uh, is ridiculous. The equipment has to turn on and it has to stay on indefinitely until the victim turns it off manually. Okay, so just ensure that it's activating immediately and that the equipment stays on indefinitely and does not self-close. Now the flow that you just saw from the equipment has to meet a certain set of requirements. Uh, we have to have a certain amount of water coming out of the devices based on the type of device to be compliant. So number one, the eye washes, the flow has to deliver a minimum of 0.4 gallons per minute or 1.5 liters. And eye face wash, since it has the addition of the face wash uh, as long as well as the uh, eye wash component, has to deliver a lot more water. So three gallons per minute or 11.4 liters for an eye face wash. And then a drench shower is a lot of, uh, a, a ton of water. At the bare minimum, the flow must deliver a minimum of 20 gallons per minute, uh, which is a ton of water, especially in com when combined with the eye washes, eye face washes, again, making testing sometimes difficult, uh, but we have to get that done and make sure the equipment works, okay? So capturing all that water when we're talking, you know, uh, 260 plus gallons um, over 15 minutes can be difficult, but there is um, a smart way to do this and uh, uh, we're happy to help you with uh, achieving that too. So the equipment in meeting with those flow controls, remember, the, remember the, that those amounts are bare minimums, okay? And, but an extreme amount of water coming out of this equipment is also not a good situation. Right, we need a controlled flow of flushing fluid at a velocity that's going to be low enough to be non injurious to the user. Number one, you're putting your face into this and your eyes. And if you have extreme amounts of water pumping out of the eye wash or the eye face wash, uh, you're not going to want to keep your eyes in that. That's going to hurt really bad. Uh, I call those brain washers. Um, the shower, uh, too, not a lot of people think about it, you know dump as much water on my body as possible, get this stuff off of me. But it, there's a smart way to do it, a controlled way to do it, like you see in the video here. If we're dumping too much water and you're in a situation where you've been exposed to corrosives uh, and hazardous materials, the potential for you to be losing the outer layer of the insulation on your body is a potential um, when dealing with those types of chemicals. And if you have an injurious 30 gallon, 40 gallon per minute flow coming from that shower, uh, the victim is, it's unlikely that they're gonna stay in that shower. It's gonna hurt, it's gonna feel terrible. I'm not sure what's gonna be worse, the chemical or the, the shower that's peeling portions of your skin off. So we need to make sure that we dial that down, get as close to those bare minimums as possible and use the water intelligently. Um, you can confirm uh, the flow rate from the shower and the eye face wash uh, and the patterns. Uh, I've got all that testing uh, coming up and I'll show you how to do that. Um, again, remember on these, the ANSI minimum flow rates, 0.4 for an eye wash, three gallons for an eye face wash. In the photos below, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You can see too much flow, an injurious flow rate on the left there. Uh, that's gonna hurt uh, terribly. Um, you're not gonna wanna put your face in that. Uh, on the right, too little flow, and the streams are too far apart. You can only use one eye at a time, and uh, you know potentially you have to make the decision in which eye is your favorite. Uh, we don't want to put people into that situation. So there's a sweet spot, and we have to hit that with emergency equipment. Uh, this is our that 9015. This is the eye wash gauge. Um, the design of this was based on the ANSI standards taken directly from the ANSI standard. They told us how to make it um, and, uh, and we did. It's a requirement um, to have this and to use it. So the flushing fluid needs to cover the areas between the interior and the exterior of the gauge at some point less than eight inches above the eyewash nozzle, okay? Now, um, the way you do this is by measuring eight inches above the nozzle, right? You start there with the gauge, you slowly lower it, and so long as the eye wash portion of the equipment aligns with the gauge, then you are compliant. Now, all this is doing is ensuring that when you're using the gauge, that it's meeting average human anthropometrics, uh, measurements of the human body, right? All of our eyes are spaced about equally, um, you know, other than like 
sloth from the Goonies or something like that. You, all of our eyes are in about the same place. This, that's what this gauge is based on. So as you're lowering it, the, the streams are meeting the eye circles. And so long as that is happening, you know that the streams are going to meet your eyes when you go to use this piece of equipment, uh, which is most important. So anywhere under eight inches, that aligns your compliant. Uh, so um, here's just a top view of the test. You can see that the streams are meeting the eye circles. We started at eight inches, we slowly lowered it, and it is going to uh, meet um, the eye circles on the gauge and be compliant. I'll, I'll show you one more time. There you go, directly centered um, and uh, capable of being used in an emergency. Now, the uh, flow pattern that's from the coming from the equipment uh, cannot be less than 33 inches and it cannot be greater than 53 inches. Uh, the reason that we're doing this is again, average human anthropometrics. When we bend over to use this equipment uh, and we're hunched over it, if it is below 33 inches, it's gonna be very difficult to use for one, okay? Uh, you have to stand here for about 15 minutes um, and that's gonna be difficult to uh, utilize if it's that low. Uh, I've never actually seen that before. I think that's, that's a pretty rare situation. The more common one is that it's above 53 inches. Now, what we're measuring is the, the top of the flow pattern coming from the heads of the device, not the head. We're focused on the top of the water stream. Now. In doing that, if it's above 53 inches, one, it's gonna be harder to align with your eyes, um, but it's also how we help to control uh, injurious flow rates and how we make that non-compliant. Because if it's shooting really high over 53 inches, uh, we can consider that injurious um, and we wanna keep it under that measurement. Um, but it's also just standing there, it's gonna be very difficult to use. Um, the minimum distance from the heads of the device needs to be six inches too. So in a radius from the center of the uh, heads of the device, measure six inches around it, has to be free of obstructions. And all we're doing here is I like to activate the equipment and then measure. Uh, you might make a little bit of a mess, but we're just trying to make sure that when you, you're likely panicking, you're in a hurry, when you go to use this equipment, you are not going to hit your head on anything. You're not going to further injure yourself uh, when you're trying to use the equipment and nothing's blocking the flow pattern coming from the eye wash or the eye face wash, um, obstructing your ability to get first aid. So flow pattern, 33 to 53 inches, just use a tape measure. Uh, measure from the surface floor of, the, of which the victim is going to be standing on. Right, that's what we want to measure from. Measure from there up to the top of the eye wash stream or eye face wash stream, and so long as it is within that 33 to 53 inches, we're compliant. And then with the six inches minimum from the heads of the device, just use a tape measure and check as a, a, a radius around the heads of the device to make sure it's clear. Uh, the shower uh, is, again, we're getting that 20 GPM. Um, but I wanted to make sure everybody understood that uh, our total flow rate for the equipment is based on the combination of the shower and the eye wash or the shower and the eye face wash for simultaneous use. So if we've got a, what is typically the most compliant type of equipment, which is an, a shower and an eye face wash, um, and slowly becoming the most common type of equipment that uh, eye face wash and shower, we have to meet 23 gallons per minute, right? That's the combination of the total uh, GPM requirements for the top and for the bottom, a little bit over that, say, you know, 24, 25, and we'll, we'd be safe. Um, but these are just the combinations of the uh, flow requirements. So to test the flow rate for the shower, um, again, this can be equipment or, uh, uh, difficult, right? You can't just do this anywhere um, and certainly not without capturing the water. Uh, that's where we come back to that 9011 test kit that we kind of showed you there at the beginning. Um, with the bucket, the shower sock, all of that. Um, so we will need that at this point. We need the five gallon bucket with the two gallon water line marked, the shower sock in the pole and the thermometer. We're gonna toss the thermometer in the bottom of the bucket, place the shower sock around the shower head and into the bucket, uh, unless you don't care about your shoes, um, and uh, which is probably not the case. Uh, and you don't wanna be sitting in soggy shoes all day. Activate the shower for six seconds. Uh, that's all we need and then check that the two gallon water level uh, mark is met on the bucket. That will ensure that we're meeting our two gallons or 20 gallons per minute. 
um, our 20 gallon GPM, right? It's again, it's like checking a pulse. Six seconds, two gallons times 10, we're meeting six seconds and 20 gallons. Uh, it's a very simple test, um, but we'll ensure that we're getting enough water out of the shower head um, to meet requirements. Now the flow pattern is a little more difficult uh, again. So if you're in a sensitive area like a school, uh, hospitals, labs, things like that, it can be difficult to just turn this on, let it rip and make a mess. So testing the flow pattern can be pretty difficult. You can be pretty confident that if you are dealing with a, a major manufacturer of emergency equipment and it is meeting the minimum GPM requirements for the ANSI standard, that it, it should be operating correctly underneath the shower sock when you're testing it. Because uh, not all of us can do this. But I would suggest trying to do this test as best you can. Uh, if you get the opportunity, you have to activate the equipment without the shower sock in place and capturing that water. What we need is to ensure that the flow pattern coming from the shower head is meeting 20 inches wide at 60 inches above the surface floor of the user. And that's, again, average human anthropometrics. Like most of our shoulders, average human height. We're making sure that the water flow pattern coming from the device is meeting us shoulder to shoulder. It's covering our entire body. Uh, we also need to make sure that the center of the flushing fluid column is clear of uh, by 16 inches uh, from the center. And again, that's making sure there's nothing obstructing us in there from us uh, getting a full flushing fluid column pattern over our body. Sometimes there's pipes and obstructions and things like that in the way. We need to make sure those are um, not present. Uh, to test for this, simply grab your tape measure, activate the equipment. Measure 60 inches above the uh, floor. I like to measure 60 inches up and uh, note the area on my body and then measure 20 inches across to ensure that I'm meeting um, the total width at the height that's required for the shower. So we wanna make sure that uh, uh, it's just like in the video here and we're ensuring that we're, we're getting the correct flow pattern. Uh, also watch out, there's an issue that's not covered in the ANSI standard yet. Um, but is a, a really serious issue. Um, you can see in this flow pattern here, this is our, our Axion technology, that's our uh, SP829 shower head. And it's spraying the water from a central nozzle on the shower head uh, and dispersing the water in a way that is going to completely canvas your body. Uh, but there is a, an effect that can be pretty dangerous when shower heads utilize the shower bell rather than a centralized nozzle in the shower head. Uh, I call this the donut effect. Um, and what it does is push all that water towards the bell and the water falls more around your body than centralized on your body and does not provide the, the type of first aid that uh, um, you would want if you're having an emergency. So uh, pay attention to the, the type of pattern that's coming out of there, not only just that it's meeting the 60 by 20 inches. Okay, uh, the shower head. Um, these uh, next two are really easy. Uh, you'll just need your tape measure. Uh, the shower head needs to be 82 to 96 inches above the surface floor of the user. Uh, if it's too low, the shower pattern will be too narrow. If it's too high, it's too wide. It's, not, uh, it's covering our body, but it's not focused on our body rinsing us off. It might be too wide and we're not getting enough water. So use a tape measure, measure from the surface floor of the user to the uh, outlet of the water, not the shower bell, whatever the water is coming out of. That's what we want. Um, so uh, again, with a, with our shower head, we'd want to measure to the outlet of the nozzle centralized in the shower head to the floor. So long as it's within that 82 to 96 inches, we're compliant. For the pull rod, uh, the pull rod can't exceed 69 inches from the surface floor of the user to the bottom of the shower handle, uh, the pull rod. And that's just to make sure that the shorter amongst us are going to be able and capable of reaching the pull rod and activating it. Uh, it doesn't matter for the taller amongst us. It, we can reach any height for the pull rod and activate it. We want to make sure that it's low enough um, and not too far from the ground that, again, uh, shorter people aren't able, able to access and activate the equipment. So simply just measure to the bottom of the pull rod. On the combination units, uh, they have to be capable of operating simultaneously. Uh, and they have to be positioned so that the components can be used simultaneously by the same user. So 
one of the most dangerous things that we run into when we survey this type of equipment, when we look at it, when we make sure, when we're testing for compliance, is that you activate your eye wash, your eye face wash, and everything is fine. We got a good flow coming from it. But then we activate the shower head. And if flow controls aren't being used, um, or if that shower head is just pumps out way too much water, the shower head can starve out the eye wash or the eye face wash. So now we have a terrible situation. We have to choose. Do I need the eye face wash, the eye wash, or do I need the shower most? Um, and we don't, again, we don't want to put people in that situation. So uh, it's called simultaneous use. It's it, the shower head will starve that equipment. And because the water is going to take the path of least resistance through the equipment, right? And if we don't have a flow control at the shower head pushing water back towards the eye wash, we can create that dangerous situation. We need to be careful. So activate them both at the same time. Ensure that there's no dip in performance to your eye washes or eye face washes. Uh, for the um, simultaneous positioning, just ensure that the eye face wash or eye wash and the shower are simultaneously aligned so that one person can use both pieces of equipment at the same time. That's all that really matters. Uh, we have to make sure that one person can use them. I, I don't know what it is, uh, Sometimes uh, the installer, whoever that ends up being, thinks they don't read the instructions. Uh, they throw them away and they decide to point the shower one way and the eye wash the other way, thinking they're for separate situations, but they're not there for one person to use at the same time. Um, another another uh, frequently um, misrepresented portion of the uh, the ANSI standard and uh, forgotten portion of the ANSI standard is that shutoff valves in the supply line for this these pieces of equipment have to be uh, um, have piece uh, lockout devices and things like that in place to prevent unauthorized shutoff. Uh, employees could walk by, visitors could walk by, maintenance team members could forget. Um, to reopen these valves um, and shut them off. And now we have no water to the device. And if somebody needs it, uh, that's gonna be create a, um, a pretty terrible situation for the victim. So all shutoff valves supplying the emergency equipment have to be locked open. Uh, and a lot of device is a great way to do that. Uh, not only will it lock the, the valve open, but it will also help to remind the maintenance team members, et cetera, that they have to go back and lock this back open. They have to reopen the valve um, so that they don't forget. If they have a you know lotto device laying around, they're gonna get pretty curious as to where, um, why they have that and where it came from. So make sure it's locked open. Uh, the equipment needs to deliver tepid flushing fluid, 60 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius is uh, that sweet spot. Um, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is still really cold, <laughs> um, but it's uh, considered uh, manageable within our 15-minute window, right? Uh, it's actually based on an old Navy SEAL test that they did. They dunked these, you know, uh, Navy SEALs in freezing water, and they're like, you have hypothermia yet, you know? Um, and they landed on 60 degrees, uh, which realistically, hypothermia is going to set in about like an hour uh, or so um, in swimming in 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's not considering weather conditions, wind, um, and uh, environmental factors in these facilities. So uh, obviously, if you couple wind with 60 degree water, hypothermia is going to be uh, exponentially um, or set on much faster than it would normally under controlled circumstances. So 75% uh, of ophthalmologists say that having that that tempered water is very important and it will increase the chances that the victim can tolerate the 15 minute flush required. If it's too cold, it might force them out. If it's way too hot and you're dealing with a corrosive situation or you know damage to your skin, again, it could force you out. So we wanna make sure it's within that range. Typically, like ideally like 85 degrees. I know that's still not like warm. It's not like a home shower. That's like 105 degrees, but 85 will keep you in there long enough to finish this out. So uh, to test this, um, you need to remember earlier, I said to throw the thermometer in the bottom of the five gallon bucket. That's what we're testing for from the shower. Uh, if it's an eye wash or eye face wash only, you would test the water coming out of that uh, device in the bowl, lay your thermometer on top or in the bowl and, um, 
and measure it that way. Otherwise, when you test the shower and you throw the thermometer in the bottom, you can get it all done in one shot. So uh, this one's kind of a no-brainer, um, but we, we have to make sure that your employees know where the emergency equipment is. Uh, employees who might be exposed to hazardous materials, even if it's a temporary situation, if they're not, you know, once a month they visit an area, um, but they're going to do something particularly dangerous, make sure they know where the emergency equipment is. So we have to be instructing them on where it is and how to use it. Uh, emergency equipment in general activates the same way across the planet. Uh, most of us have a push flag and a pull rod, but there are pieces of equipment that vary from that. Uh, they don't have a push flag. Uh, I, I can think of one that you have to lift the lid. Um, some of them have a push flag for the shower and things like that. So make sure they understand that type of equipment, how it's activated and how to get it, um, uh, you know, how to provide first aid from the equipment as quick as possible. I like to quiz employees on the location of the nearest piece of equipment and ask them uh, to give me a demonstration of how you would uh, activate it without turning it on. Nobody wants to go home soggy. Uh, check for the need for freeze protection. Uh, where the possibility of freezing conditions exist, the unit uh, needs to be protected from freezing or freeze protected equipment needs to be installed. Uh, so just check your local weather patterns uh, for sub freezing temperatures. Uh, or any internal process in your facility that may create a freezing environment. Um, once these pipes freeze, they have the potential to leak, uh, especially with valves and things like that. Um, and uh, once it's frozen, if somebody needs it, the, they're out of luck. Um, there's no way that you can get that piece of equipment um, thawed and ready to use in time for somebody's uh, first aid uh, emergency. So we have to make sure that it's protected using heat trace, um, tempering, and things like that. Uh, one of the installation considerations that we have to think about, uh, this is in Appendix B5 of the ANSI standard, and all it says is that a single step into an enclosure where the equipment can be accessed is not considered to be an obstruction. And that's because the booth that you see on the right there is a type of equipment that we cannot make flush with the ground. This is portable. Uh, it's a very heavy duty piece of equipment. Um, and it's a sealed compartment. It's a tempered or uh, tepid compartment. So we've got a heater running in there. It's keeping the equipment from freezing. It's making sure that the victim is warm during their first aid emergency or cool. We can add chilling technology to these, which means we can't make it flush to the ground. So they had to add a installation consideration for booth type of equipment um, so that we could allow a single step into that booth. Remember earlier I said no change in level. Well, this would be non-compliant with the exception of this appendix uh, consideration in B5. So if it's not a booth, you don't get a step, no change in level. If it is a booth, you are allowed one single step into the enclosure. Doors uh, can constitute a non-compliance issue. Um, uh, a door doesn't uh, does not constitute an obstruction if it meets the following requirements. So you can have a door, but it has to meet these requirements um, to be located between the hazard and your emergency equipment. It has to be non-locking. We we wouldn't want anybody locking the door and forgetting, or it be self-locking and not be able to get to the equipment. The doors have to open in the direction of the emergency equipment. The hazard has to be non-corrosive. Uh, so the second it's corrosive, no no doors, and they have to be push bar or panic bar activated. Um, you're going to be exactly that. You're going to be panicking. You're going to want to push the door, it fly open, you have immediate access to the emergency equipment. Okay, so we are going to launch uh, our second poll question here. Again, uh, your uh, participation is greatly appreciated. Uh, we just have a couple more of those uh, following. Not a lot. Um, I think we'll have a total of five. Um, and Nicole's going to get that started for us right now. Okay. <clears throat> Poll number two is, what are you likely to do after today's webinar? Check all that apply, and if this does not answer to you, please do not answer. All right, we'll give you just a couple more seconds here. All right, we'll go ahead 
And I'll wrap that up. And back to Justin. OK, thanks again. Appreciate it. Um, moving on, um, we have some recommended best practices uh, that I like to cover. Uh, things that aren't frequently thought of um, that are our experience uh, in um, you know, dealing with emergency equipment, manufacturing it, and uh, helping has really uh, um, uh, given us more information on. Uh, so to start, um, evaluate the equipment location. So equipment should be located in areas with adequate space for emergency responders. Uh, we wanna make sure that they can fulfill their response activities, right? So once the victim is ready to exit the equipment, uh, right, the emergency is not over. We've got the substances, uh, the hazardous materials off of the victim. Um, but at this point, we uh, want to make sure that when the first responders get there, they are capable um, and able to, you know, get them on a, a, a stretcher um, uh, and deliver other first aid activities uh, and things like that. So make sure there's plenty of space around the emergency equipment. Uh, Locate other first aid equipment near the emergency shower or eye wash. Um, you know, first responders may not be the fastest. You're going to be present. If there are things that you can do to help alleviate uh, their first aid needs and things like that, then, uh, um, whoops, I accidentally progressed and did it again. There we go. <laughs> so uh, locate the first aid equipment as, as near as possible. Uh, it's gonna help with the situation. It makes the emergency equipment uh, kind of a, a beacon for first aid in the area, uh, which is ideal. Um, and then uh, train the employees on how to access and activate the equipment during the emergency. Uh, I just like to bring that up again because it's, it's highly important and it's uh, not frequently done. So uh, this is actually ANSI Z535.1, um, and it colors uh, hazard color coding for equipment. And uh, this is more of a bragging point for me. I just like to bring it up. Uh, red, danger stop. It's usually uh, emergency stop bar, button on machinery. Yellow is a caution uh, color, tripping, falling, striking hazards, things that we need to keep our eyes out for. Orange is parts of machinery or equipment that can cut, crush, or otherwise injure you. And then green, the color of a emergency equipment manufacturer whose webinar you might be attending at the moment, is the location of safety equipment, uh, as it should be. Green is first aid. Green is safety, right? Green means go. So uh, I just, I like to bring that up. <laughs> uh, Okay, real quick, correct equipment for the hazard. Um, a lot of people are a little confused about, you know, what type of equipment do I use versus what do I have in place? The real answer to that is in your SDS sheets, your safety data sheets for the hazardous material that you're dealing with. Go to the first aid section. It will say in that section, rinse eyes out for 15 minutes, rinse skin for 15 minutes, uh, rinse, you know, skin and eyes for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. It's gonna tell you exactly what the requirements are. Um, but uh, these are the typical situations that these types of equipment are used for. So eye washes, wood shavings, dust, airborne particulates, stuff that's not going to affect your skin, uh, but can do serious damage to your eyes, right? Uh, an eye face wash, minor instance affecting only the eyes and face, uh, low, you know, uh, pH type situations where it's not going to affect your, it could affect the sensitive uh, skin and organs on your face, but not really the rest of your body. A drench shower, drench showers are very uncommon pieces of equipment by themselves. It makes much more sense to have an eye wash or an eye face wash with a drench shower than a drench shower alone, right? You would never look up and put your eyes into like a, into a drench shower. Uh, that's gonna hurt uh, like crazy. Um, and should the uh, situation present itself, you'd want the option to use an eye face wash or an eye wash. And when you're using a shower, you're talking about full body decontamination, 
right? So you'd want that eye wash or eye face wash in place. Now, a drenched shower is typically used for PPE decontamination, personal protective equipment decontamination. That's really where a drenched shower by itself comes in uh, to the fold and comes in handy uh, when you need to rinse off the protective gear that you're wearing before you remove it. A combination unit is ideal for all situations, right? Chemical exposure for the eyes, the face, the body, it will rinse your entire uh, uh, being off and uh, prevent contamination uh, for your entire body. Those are the most common type of equipment that we uh, um, that we find out there other than, you know, the eye washes and eye face washes and school labs and things like that. So uh, make sure you're providing beyond tepid water. Uh, water that's too hot could drive the injured user out of the emergency equipment way too soon. Um, remember what type of chemicals you're dealing with to ensure that we're um, not creating those types of situations. Uh, sometimes hotter water can exacerbate the situation. Uh, and then on the too cold, we're risking cardi uh, cold shock, cardiac arrest. Um, the user could end uh, the flushing before the recommended time, and they may not remove their clothing, um, which is incredibly important. Um, you got to be in your birthday suit uh, for this. Um, clothing can, can uh, trap the contaminants, the, the chemicals between your clothing and your skin, uh, making for a very dangerous situation um, that you may not be aware of since you're already in pain. It will continue to do damage to you. So, uh, shirt, pants, socks, shoes, it's all got to come off. Um, and then uh, on the too hot side, again, one of the things that I wanted to touch on real quick is Legionella bacteria. Uh, it grows and thrives between 95 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll notice that 95 degrees is within our ANSI tepid water range, uh, which will probably change in the standard Eventually, I imagine Legionella bacteria is a, a huge deal, um, and the effects that it can have in, uh, on you after you've received first aid, uh, you've gotten to the hospital, can be um, can make a, a bad situation even worse. So um, uh, our average residential shower is about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's where we're comfy at. So 85 degrees isn't going to be awful. <laughs> you're going to be more worried about you know what you're contaminated with. Uh, but 85 degrees is really that kind of sweet spot for uh, tepid water. Uh, it's a little easier to accomplish. It's in that mid-range, um, and it'll keep you from going uh, one way or the other non-compliant. Okay, so uh, poll question number three, and then uh, we've got a couple other um, topics to discuss real quick, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Uh, Nicole, if you would, please. All right. Uh, would you be interested in learning more about tepid water solutions? And I know we're running just a few minutes over. Us getting started late has uh, messed a little bit with our timeline. We have just a couple more um, things to touch on, and we'll get you out of here. I'll give you just one more second here. All right, there we go. And I know I can uh, I can drone on a bit. I I get very passionate about this stuff, um, and I get very excited about uh, first aid practices and it, like of all the things I could uh, nerd out about. I don't I don't know why it's safety, but um, I know I go on a little bit too far sometimes. Uh, which is why I'm going to launch into additional best practices that you need to know. Um, number one, remove your contacts. Uh, don't rub your eyes. Uh, the contacts will act the same way as the clothes and trap contaminants. Disrobe completely, including your socks and shoes. Get it all off. It's not the time to be modest. Um, providing a privacy curtain can help a lot with that type of situation. Um, giving our coworkers a, a private place to have their first aid emergency. Uh, it even comes with a little robe in the little uh, um, area inside of that curtain. So um, providing those can really help. Make sure you're doing bump tests before high risk tasks. So if you know you're going to do something that's particularly dangerous, maybe go over to the eye wash or safety shower and just make sure that it works, you know, um, 
give it a quick on off and then go do the incredibly dangerous task, uh, just as a suggestion. Uh, be cautious who you're uh, assisting uh, and how you're assisting them so that you don't contaminate yourself, right? Give them verbal cues, yell and scream at your coworker. Um, HR is not gonna get upset. Uh, you're going to get them to the piece of emergency equipment as quickly and as safely as possible. But if you touch them, you run the risk of damaging and hurting yourself. Uh, ensure that the signage is, uh, that is in use at the equipment is the correct type of signage. So we don't want somebody to have an emergency, see a shower sign, run over and realize that it's a, a decon shower with no eye wash or eye face wash or the opposite, right? That there's no shower. I needed a shower, but there was a shower sign there. So make sure there's the correct type of signage for the equipment, okay? Uh, moving on. Uh, I want to talk to everybody real quick about a uh, program that is near and dear to me personally here at this uh, uh, at Haas. Um, this is our ANSI emergency shower eye wash uh, and uh, shower survey program. What this is is a complementary emergency shower and eye face wash survey. Uh, what we will do is uh, I have. Uh, representatives across the country, personally trained by yours truly, um, on the ANSI standard, on how to test for those standards, on how to um, uh, subject matter experts in this field. Uh, and what they'll do is they will they'll visit your site uh, if you would like them to. <laughs> um, I would like for you to like them too. Uh, and the offering includes a full day of inspections of what, all the emergency equipment th that they can get to. We'll give you an inspection report uh, detailing all of our findings, an executive summary chart, uh, again, giving us a, um, uh, a breakdown of your overall compliance uh, on site at your facility, recommendations on how to fix the things that we found. We won't just you know, find all these uh, non-compliances and then bail on you. We'll, we'll, we'll help you through uh, fixing those uh, issues that we found. Uh, a debriefing meeting web conference with uh, our representative uh, or with me as well, uh, explaining what our findings were and answer any questions you might have. Um, there are some restrictions that apply, mostly uh, distance concerns uh, from where your facility is and where our representatives are. Um, and then of course, if you have like a, a squeeze bottle on hand, uh, you know, we're not going to come uh, inspect a, a squeeze bottle or, uh, you know, one or two pieces of equipment. I'll, I'll help you through that personally if you want to give us a call. Um, but we want to make sure that we're doing, you know, a, as close to a full day of inspections, you know, 10 uh, pieces of equipment or something like that uh, as possible. Uh, on the right here, uh, this is, these are real stats um, based on work that we've done so far. Uh, we find that about one in five pieces of equipment, uh, emergency equipment, shower, eye wash, eye face wash, has a uh, or will work. It's compliant. Um, about uh, four out of those five pieces of equipment have a performance-related issue, meaning the eye wash, eye face wash, or shower does not perform the way that it's supposed to um, and creates a really dangerous situation. Again, a lot of this equipment gets neglected, unfortunately. So you can see overall compliance about 12% total, fully compliant pieces of equipment. Um, and then uh, the link is there, uh, hosco.com forward slash survey, or reach out to me directly, Justin Dunn. Uh, my information will be at the end of the survey. Uh, fill out the form and we'll make sure that we get our, our representative uh, in touch with you as soon as possible. Um, now we are going to uh, launch poll question number four. Uh, Nicole has a quick message for you after that, and then we're going to um, get into our Q&A. Okay, so based on all of that information, uh, would you be interested in a free site survey of your existing emergency equipment for ANSI compliance? All right, I'll give you just a couple more seconds here to wrap this up. All right. Uh, okay, so as Justin said, I'm going to go ahead and dive into our um, HAS services program. 
And that's very similar. It tags on to what Justin was just describing um, and going through the statistics. And what Haas Services does, it really provides the most comprehensive service in the market. Um, we provide on-site evaluation and testing of your emergency uh, equipment against the ANSI standards. Um, we have, as Justin said, experts across the country. We have them um, located within the regions that can come out um, and really help make sure that your equipment is meeting these standards. And it really is, um, sort of customized solutions um, for your specific needs at your facility. We, 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 excuse me, we service uh, facilities ranging from manufacturing to healthcare. So across industries, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what we can do, our team provides, um, we can do your weekly and annual ANSI inspections. We can do these, um, you can hire us for a maintenance contract and alleviate all of those resource and time burdens and focus your energy on um, other day-to-day -day, uh, operations. We also do repairs and upgrades on the equipment. Um, we have a lot of different um, services that we provide within, um, like I said, Haas services. Um, but again, from education to actually doing the work for you. So that will lead into our last and final question, which is, I can pull it up here. All right, lastly, would you be interested in learning more about Haas Services and its benefits to your maintenance program? I'll give you just a quick second here. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap that up. All right, so we're gonna jump real quickly into the question and answers. <clears throat> to be mindful of everybody's time, what we'll do here is we'll tackle a handful of questions um, uh, right now, and then the remainder of these questions that we weren't able to tackle, what we'll do is just send out um, the list of questions and all of the answers associated. So to save us time, I'm just gonna have Justin read and go through uh, his responses. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna work down our, our list here real quick and I'll start at the top. So uh, what is the compliant method to test the temperature at an emergency fixture? Um, so easiest method, uh, thermometer, um, throw it in the bucket, test the shower. Uh, during that test, um, usually your, your weekly activation test, you can simultaneously uh, gather information about the temperature of the water. I would suggest though, if the emergency equipment is near like an outer wall of your facility um, and might be pulling cold groundwaters maybe sooner than other emergency equipment in your facility or is near a process that is particularly cold in your facility, run it a little bit longer. Uh, just to see if it pulls that cold water into the system, right? Um, so make sure you're uh, using the, the thermometer. Um, also a, a laser thermometer is also a pretty handy little tool. Um, just be wary that you might be measuring the temperature of the, the plastic through the water, uh, not the actual water. So give it a, a couple seconds to come to temp. Um, okay, uh, next uh, at thermos, oh, uh, I'm not hearing anything. Too bad is the answer for that. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I, th I think we got that all figured out, uh, but that was just the, the issues we we're having a little uh, um, early on there in the webinar. Uh, let me get down here. Um, are thermostatic mixing valves required? Uh, no, they're not uh, at the moment, but it is the most efficient way to mix your, your hot and cold water sources and provide a consistent temperature of water out of your emergency equipment, right? 
We want that located as close to the emergency equipment as possible. Get your hot and cold water source. Uh, we can put a gauge on those so that you know the temperature at the mixing valve, right? Um, which might go lend to the earlier question um, and measuring the water temperature at those thermostatic mixing valves. Uh, you can usually just add a, um, a gauge on there uh, to make it a little bit easier. Um, and uh, and but it's not required. Uh, we do highly suggest having one though um, to ensure that uh, uh, you're getting that 85 degrees sweet spot uh, out of your emergency equipment. Um, next question: Where in the regulations does OSHA reference the ANSI standard? So uh, this question is. Uh, the bane of my existence. Uh, OSHA does a really poor job of advertising the fact that they reference the ANSI standard. If you go to OSHA's website and you reference 29 CFR 1910.151C, there are many articles and um, questions where OSHA responds directly and says, you have to reference ANSI Z358.1 2014 to remain in compliance with 29 CFR 1910.151C. Um, and that's uh, the, the primary area where they reference the standard, uh, other than in person, uh, getting your inspector out there um, and, and dealing with uh, uh, an audit and things like that, they'll of course reference the ANSI standard every time. Uh, they don't just reference 29 CFR uh, 1910, but they, they reference ANSI directly in their uh, fines and, um, and compliance issues. Um, all right, let's move down the list here. Uh, how do you get a gauge for testing eyewashes? Does Haas sell these or can you make one uh, internally? Uh, we sell a very inexpensive one. Uh, it's a 9015. Uh, you can pick one up from us. Uh, it's super inexpensive. It's an easy tool to use. Um, and uh, if you're going to do that, I would highly suggest uh, investing in something like the 9011 testing kit. It comes with that the bucket, the shower sock, the whole uh, kit and caboodle, and is really one of the best compliance tools uh, that's available um, and highly easy, uh, to, easy to use. Um, What is the, I'm gonna to try to answer this one the best I can. What is the point of the shower head bowl? Is there, is just the nozzle that is directing the water? I, I think I understand the question. So, uh, so we have a shower bell on our shower head, our SP829 shower head, um, and in our uh, Axion kits uh, for our technology. And for the shower head, um, the shower bell, since the water's coming out of a centralized nozzle in the equipment, she's curious what the actual purpose of the shower bell is. Um, and realistically, it's just so that you identify that piece of equipment as a shower. Uh, that's it. We want to make it as highly visible as possible. We want it to look like a shower head. Um, and adding that bell onto the equipment helps you to identify it faster, <laughs> right? Um, otherwise, the bell can be removed. It can just be the nozzle sitting there. Um, it's not required, uh, but we add it on there because we're Haas and we like to go uh, overboard and, and make our equipment as accessible and identifiable and as 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 great as possible for you. Um, so that one was easy. Does the answer standard uh, take into account ADA compliance? Uh, I thought the pull rod needed to be no more than 48 inches for ADA. That's a very uh, good question, Matt. So with uh, the ANSI standard, uh, the ADA, if you didn't know, um, I actually I, I held, uh, hold an ADA webinar as well, um, but the ADA was actually based on an ANSI standard um, originally before it was uh, signed into uh, um, law and and uh, Justin Dart had his hand in everything um, but the uh, the ANSI standard Z358.1 doesn't take into consideration specifically ADA requirements we'll reference ADA for that and uh, you're absolutely right about the uh, reach height for the pull rod um, and for the push flag for the eyewash and the eye face wash so 
uh, there is specific ADA accessible emergency equipment um, that is designed with that exactly in mind. They have a longer bowl that comes out from the emergency equipment um, at a height to allow for knee and toe clearance underneath the emergency equipment. And the pull rod is at a height that allows for uh, easy access to uh, the pull rod. So there absolutely is uh, ADA designed equipment um, for uh, for your facilities, uh, but you have to hunt it out uh, specifically. So if you have an accessible area where you have to have that type of equipment, we can accommodate you. That is available and it's uh, based on the ADA standards. Um, but in keeping with that, the pull rod has to be no higher than 69 inches, right? So it can be any uh, depth below that, uh, any height from the ground up to 69 inches. So it could be, you know, 10 inches from the ground, so long as it's easy to activate um, and it's still technically be compliant. Um, okay, I think we're going to get to one, one more here. Um, Let's see here, Brandy's the winner. Uh, best practice is to have a lockout device on the valve in the on position question mark. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, put a lotto device onto the valve, or if it's a locking valve, a, a padlock, a lotto padlock or something like that, um, locking it open is required. We cannot have unauthorized shutoff to an emergency equipment be a possibility. OK, so um, we have to make sure that we're providing those devices. Uh, they're locked out and uh, um, they're only in the off position for maintenance type situations. OK, um, that's going to be it for our, uh, our Q&A. Um, here's our contact information. Uh, again, my name is Justin Dunn. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. We greatly appreciate it. Um, all of our contact information is there. Uh, we also have the live chat feature on the uh, website. So feel free to reach out through there for any other questions you might have uh, or assistance you might need with your compliance. I hope that everybody takes what they learned today. Uh, you go forth, you be champions for compliance for your emergency equipment. And please reach out to us if you need any assistance, help or uh, questions otherwise. Thank you again. We appreciate it and have a wonderful day.